title of this morning or this evening's message, excuse me, goes along with obviously the Lord's Supper, simply entitled The Communion Made Possible by the Cross. The Communion Made Possible by the Cross. John chapter 15, we're going to look at verse number 1. In fact, I want to begin by reading the entire uh, passage here. Verse number 1 down through verse number 17 of John chapter 15. Uh, Christ and the Scriptures give us many analogies. I especially like the ones that come from Christ's lip, lips himself. And that obviously includes this one, him being presented as the vine, we as the branches. And so, great truth. Let's read it together. Uh, I'll read out loud as you read quietly. Notice it. He says, verse number 1 of John chapter 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And the men gather them, and cast them in the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another." There is much teaching in this passage, and tonight we don't have uh, uh, the, the opportunity to really delve into it, break it down verse by verse. But if we were to step back and look at it at what, from what we might call a bird's eye view, you might say there's several uh, big lessons to be learned, certainly fruit bearing and so forth. Well, one of those would be the idea that it is a lesson. Now, don't miss this tonight because I think this is appropriate as we consider the Lord's Supper. It is a lesson on intimate fellowship with Christ. Intimate fellowship or communion with Christ, each one of us as believers. You know, the reality is this, even within uh, the church among believers, there's some people who just visit Christ and others who abide in Christ. There are some who are just acquaintances with Christ, while others are what we might call bosom brothers with Christ. There are some who uh, they add Jesus Christ to their lives, while there's some who give their lives over to Jesus Christ. That passage, this passage, is really hitting on that. It's driving that truth home. And may I put it this way, it really sheds light on the fact that there are things that even separate us as believers. The degree of intimate fellowship that we have with Christ. How do we commune with him on a daily basis? How do we fellowship with our God and our Christ as we walk this earth and as we go through life? In many ways, the depth, the degree of our fellowship can separate us. You have some believers that are just acquaintances with Christ. You have others that, boy, they enjoy a deep, close intimacy with Christ. You see, when we think of the vast array of branches within the family of God, and not to mention those who claim to be Christians but truly aren't, we can understand that not all of us are enjoying the same intimate fellowship with God. In fact, it was Jesus Christ himself. He, he spoke of what we might term a progression of intimacy. A progression of intimacy that begins when we get saved. And boy, now we are reconciled. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And now the relationship begins. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, when you are married, and boy, you put many years behind you in marriage, and you think, wow, I have really gotten to know my spouse. 
Oh, so different from the first day of marriage, the second day of marriage, and so forth and so on. Boy, a relationship grows because you come to know someone from spending intimate time with them, a closeness. You grow in that fellowship. Uh, and, and when we use the word intimacy, understand that the, the general definition of intimacy is just closeness and familiarity. Closeness and familiarity. We'll be right back here to John 15. Go back to John chapter 13 with me, if you will. Notice how Christ kind of begins and how he describes our relationship as a Christian. And I would say pretty much right at salvation. John chapter 13, look at verse number 13. Jesus Christ speaking, and he says this. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. So I'd ask you this, what relational position it, for us is implied in the verse? What relational position for us is implied in the verse? Well, notice the terms, master and Lord. He says, that's exactly right, I am your master Lord. Well, we can infer easily, and what's implied in that verse is this. If he is the master and Lord, who are we? We are the servants, right? We're the servants. In fact, John chapter 15 alludes to it, so we'll go back there and see that. He mentions it here, but I love this passage, this verse, because Christ says, you are the servants. Now, I would submit to you that one of the first truths that we must embrace after coming to Christ in salvation is that I am a servant of God. We, we like the term in the Greek, the doulos. It is uh, one who is blessed to be a slave in the house of God. In, in the kingdom of God, I, uh, the psalmist wrote, what, better to be a doorman, right? <laughs> I mean, it is better to be a slave in God's house than anything else anywhere else. We, we think of that, uh, why as a servant and slave, why, why should we be excited about being a servant and slave? Well, my friend, you and I are forever indebted to God. You say, why? Well, look at John 15. Look at verse 3. You remember how he put it? We just read it. He said this in, in John chapter 15, verse number 3. He goes this. Why are we indebted? Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. What a great truth. You and I have been made clean tonight. Literally, we are forgiven of our sins as we have trusted in the word of God for salvation. The sins that stained us, the sins that destined us for hell are all gone, thanks to Jesus Christ. Uh, those sins that made me, uh, my sins were like scarlet, Jesus Christ has made my account white as snow. That's us. We, man, we are so indebted to Jesus Christ. You know, I want to remind you, too, when we talk of this perspective of us being the servant or slave of God, it is not God that emphasizes this all the time. In fact, very much, it's from our perspective. I mean, I am a servant of God because I am indebted to him. I am, I am debt-driven, as we said several years ago for our theme. I am debt-driven and duty-bound. I know I'm here to serve God, and that is a joy. That is a thrill to our hearts. It ought to delight us that I could even be a servant, a slave of God. Paul reveled in the thought of being a slave for God, of being a servant of God. He often signed off his letters, not the, the great missionary Paul. You know what he said? A servant of Jesus Christ. He bragged on it. He loved it. He said, man, this is who I am. And so for, it's from a human perspective. In fact, I would put it this way. If you say, hey, you know, I, don't, I don't like the thought of being a servant. My friend, when you and I look in the spiritual mirror every day, we ought to see a servant. We ought to see a slave to God. We ought to see someone who's indebted to God, a debt that I can never repay. And my goodness, I owe my God so much for what he has done for me. And I want to encourage you, that perspective ought to never change. That, that I can't ever repay it. I owe him so much, and I would gladly be his slave, his servant. Now, don't miss this. Jesus Christ alluded to this when he gave the parable of the prodigal son, didn't he? The prodigal son is in the uh, far country. He's, he's down with the pork, uh, with the pigs. He's eating their food. And, and you know, I love the terminology. It's literally that he came to his senses. He realized, wait a minute. Man, if I just go back to dad's house and I become a servant or a slave or dad, man, he, I, I can do no better for myself than what God could do for me. And may I tell you, at salvation, you and I realized to be a servant, a slave of God, I could never do better for myself. 
That is the best place to be in the kingdom of God as a, slave, as a servant or a slave. It is a reality that, man, I, yeah, I'm indebted to him forever, but there is no better place for me, uh, better than anything that we could achieve on our own. It's true for every one of us. So this evening, I want to encourage you not to recoil at being a servant or slave of God. Literally, it's to be celebrated. It's to be rejoiced in because we can do no better for ourselves by ourselves. Yet in God's demonstration of his amazing love and heart for us, he desires this relational position to change. God doesn't want you and I to stick as a, a slave and a servant, though you and I should always have that perspective that I want to be a servant of God, a slave of God. I can't ever repay him, so I'm going to just continually serve him. But long ago, when God saved us, he doesn't want us to remain as a servant and slave in relation. Oh, no, he wants us to go well beyond that enjoying a more intimate fellowship with him. Look back at here in chapter 15. Look at verses 14 and 15. Notice what he says. He says, ye are my friends, verse 14. If ye do whatsoever I command you, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Now, what a great statement. He said, listen, I, this is a transition in our fellowship, our relation, our intimacy, our closeness. And my friend, may I tell you, I am so delighted that the God of heaven wants to have a progressing uh, relationship with us. He, he just doesn't look at us as a saving servant. That's what you're always being, so get used to it. No, he looks at you and I said, listen, I've saved you. Yes, you're indebted to me, but I don't want you to always be like a slave and a servant. I want you to become a friend. Do you realize how much joy it would be if Jesus Christ walked in and he said, hey, friend. That's literally what this is speaking of. I call you friends. So we go from uh, that relational position of servant to God wants you and I, Christ wants us to be his friends. And I'll tell you, that's a whole lot better, isn't it? Friends sounds much better than servants. So let's ask this question. What makes that difference? What, what progresses us along in this uh, change in our closeness, our familiarity, our intimacy? Well, Christ says this from these two verses. It means you know his heart. You know the master's thinking and doing. He says this, yet you're no longer a servant because now I've told you what I, the master, am doing. And he goes on to say, boy, what God the Father has told me, now I'm telling you. It is a revelation of his heart. What Christ had been doing was pouring out his teaching, his philosophies, his word into the disciples. He had elevated, don't miss it, he had elevated them to friends brought them into his inner circle of friends, shared with them a closeness of familiarity that no human servant would ever have with a human master while in that position. Uh, that wouldn't take place between a human master and a human servant like what is taking place spiritually for us. And may I put it this way? He sure has done the very same thing for you and I. The Bible that you and I hold in our hands could be described as the means that God has given us to go from servant to friend. Here's how you hear what God says. He says, these things be made known. Here's how you learn the heart of the master. And uh, No more servants, but friends. Here's how you enter into the closeness, the intimacy of Jesus Christ as a friend. You want to know the ways and the will and the, the wishes of the master? Grab your Bible, read it, study it, saturate your mind and heart with it. See, within the passage here in John chapter 15, what are we encouraged to do? Well, the term is abide. What does abide mean? Well, it has been said to refer to this, and I like this description. It's maintaining an unbroken yet growing communion with Jesus Christ. Maintaining an unbroken yet growing communion with Jesus Christ. So part of this abiding, this communion to be pursued and enjoyed with Christ and is learning and studying all the things the Father in heaven has given us, making it known unto ourselves. That's literally what Christ says in the verse. Certainly as the passage speaks of. Now, you say, okay, that's, uh, the, I see, I see what you're saying. That's a good transition in a relationship. And yet the passage goes on to say, okay, now there's going to be tangible fruit that each of our relational positions produce in our lives. You see, as a servant, when you and I embrace with joy and gladness, that perspective that I am a servant uh, of God, it produces obedience to the master. 
You see, to happily do the will of the master as a servant demonstrates our recognition of our great debt in his ownership. I love the passage that Paul says, hey, you don't belong to yourself, you belong to God. That's part of the mentality of a servant. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. And so I belong to someone else. I've been redeemed. And so I am a servant, a slave to him. And so that in itself ought to produce obedience. It ought to produce a, a doing the will of the Father and as a servant or a slave might. And we know to not do, that is to not obey, the Bible says is one of those sins of omission. Like that of not believing. Like that of not loving. Those are sins of omission. Yet as a friend... The fruit, now don't miss this, the fruit is even described in this passage, the fruit as a friend takes on greater dimension and deeper meaning. As it is produced in, uh, in the growing knowledge of Christ gained through greater closeness. There is a loyalty to develop that is a loyalty to all that is his. There's a commitment that wells up inside me to further his name and reputation, or reputation as his friend. And my actions and my good works uh, are committed in defense of all he holds dear. You see, this idea of abiding in John chapter 15, and boy, it produces a progression of intimacy. You see, this unbroken, growing communion, it grows deeper and sweeter, and more intimate with the progression of our relationship. What a joy there is to be friends with Jesus Christ, to call him friend. What delight there is to know the counsel and the heart of the Savior. May I just ask you, how good has it been to know the end of the story these last few months? Has it been good? Isn't it good to know that God's on still on the throne as we studied this morning? Isn't it good to know that God's going to judge all sin? Isn't it good to know that one day you and I will be out of this place? It's good to know that. You know why that comes? Because you and I enjoy those moments of being a friend with God. We study the Word. We hear what's on His heart. We learn what, what the Father told Him. And boy, we study it. And in those moments, man, we're drawing closer to Christ. And boy, it is good to be a friend of Jesus Christ. It's good, and it ought to continue. It ought to be something that we maintain and work at, as we'll speak on later. Now, notice it. I think this is so crucial. God wants this intimacy to continue to grow, continue to increase. This relational position, he wants it to evolve, not, to, uh, not for the idea of servant to be done with. Let's just build to that. I, I, I think of it, our relationship, it adds layers. See, if you're married, you ought to call your, sp your spouse, ought to be a good friend, your best friend. They also ought to, ought to have many roles in the relationship, many descriptions of that relationship. And so it is for God. I, yeah, as I got saved, I realized, man, I'm a, sa I'm a servant, a, a slave of God. And boy, it just kind of grows. Now I'm a, I'm a friend of Jesus Christ. And then he adds something else to it. Man, this is wonderful. Look at Matthew chapter 12, if you will, with me. Matthew chapter number 12. We'll look at the end of the chapter, Matthew Matthew chapter 12, verse 47 and following. Matthew chapter 12, verse 47 and following. Notice the statement Christ makes here. Matthew 12, 47, 48, 49, and 50. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? <laughs> who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Let me ask you again, what is the relational position described here? Well, he literally says we are his brothers, his sisters. We are family. So, hey, servant to friend, and now he says, man, I want you to grow in closeness and intimacy and familiarity with me, where you're like a part of the family. May I describe it this way? Servants may be around in the house, but they sure do miss out on a lot. Uh, friends, uh, they gain a little bit more, yet they come and go. They visit often, sure, but they still miss things. But family stays permanently in a position of intimacy. 
Family stays permanently in a position of intimacy. Family knows pretty much all. They enjoy a closeness and intimacy that nothing can rival. Christ here describes his brothers and sisters as though that do the, uh, those that do the will of his fathers which is in heaven. This is the family. This is what the brothers said. Now listen, hey, from a human perspective, sometimes we're like this because I know I am. I like to be a very private person, uh, even with my own family, because you know what? I don't want people to be disappointed when they get to know me because I'm nothing but failure. <laughs> I'm broken. I, I'm imperfect. Man, I, I'll let you know. I, I have a human flesh, sinful nature. Man, I don't want people to get too close because they'll see the real thing. Aren't you grateful when you and I get closer and closer to Christ, we see nothing but perfectness? That's what he wants. You and me from a human like, well, no, I don't want somebody, I don't want somebody that close to me. Jesus Christ says, come, <laughs> get close to me, and you'll find a perfect God, a perfect Savior, that's his desire. And notice the description here. Man, he, those who do the will of the Father which is in heaven. You don't get any closer than a brother or sister. And this is amazing. Christ is unashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. Paul, speaking of Jesus Christ in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, notice the statement. For both he that sanctifieth, that's he's speaking of Christ, and they who are sanctified are all of one, the Father, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And isn't that fantastic? Jesus Christ has no problem. He's not ashamed. In fact, he's happy to call you brother or sister. The Savior. Man, that ought to humble us and thrill us all at the same time. It goes on, and certainly this passage intimates here in Matthew, the one that parallels in Mark chapter 3, that when Christ spoke of doing the will of the Father, you say, okay, what does that mean? When he says, okay, here's my brothers and sisters, how do I enter into that a closeness, this, this fellowship, this intimacy that would describe me as a brother or sister of God, part of the family? Well, really that terminology is described elsewhere in scriptures, but it, it literally means the idea that doing the will of the Father, it speaks of a full abandonment of one's own life and will while replacing it with obedience and followership of God's will. And yet it's an action rooted not as much in the debt as a servant, but in one's love for Christ. I have grown so close to him as a friend. I mean, I, as a Jonathan David kind of friendship, where, boy, it is, it is, it is agape love, phileo love, all wrapped up together. And, man, I, I love him so much. And, and I'm going to abandon my life, and I'm going to follow him completely. I'm going to be a true disciple. You know, I've heard some of you say this. Man, I would do anything for family. I would do anything for family. And that's good. But do you realize that you and I ought to be the brothers and sisters of Christ? And we ought to say, I'll do anything for family. You name it. You ask it, God. I'll do it. That's the intimacy spoken of here. That's the desire of God to enjoy that kind of relationship with you. We can't reach such an intimate closeness through um, our own measures outside of abiding in him. Knowing his will, doing his will, all the time enjoying deeper and deeper communion with him in our lives. And what does that bring? What do we get to enjoy when we reach this intimacy, this closeness, this familiarity as family? Well, there's unique privileges to that. There's a special access to his presence there's, that we enjoy and glean from. There's a greater protection from a human perspective. Isn't it wonderful to have a big brother who is strong when you're getting in a fight on the playground? May I tell you, when you're close with God, it's good to have God on your side when you're in spiritual battles, amen? When you're close to him, and this is family, man, he's going to stick up, and we are walking with him, we are close to him. My goodness, what a, to be intimate with the very heart of God ought to be the, the, the desire of every believer. I want to be a servant, but man, I want to be a friend, and I want to add another layer. I want to be a brother and sister to Christ. I want to be that close to him where we are, man, blood brothers. Remember that as a kid? <laughs> I don't know where that started, <laughs> but I remember doing it. <laughs> you know, yeah, man, that's who we are with Christ. We're so close. We're like this, and nothing's going to separate. Man, that's what God desires, to rise above the level of just servant and master is what we should want. I like to think of it this way, and, and, 
I, I hope this resonates. If it doesn't, we'll quickly get past it. Um, <laughs> I like to think of this one. Hey, mom, wife, ha- have you ever at home, <laughs> ha- have you ever had someone in your home that kind of made you just feel like you were a slave or a servant? Have you ever as a mom or dad, yeah, or excuse me, a mom or, or a wife, and I, I may be on thin ice here, but anyway, have you ever as a, as a wife or a mother, you looked at, at your kid and you say, who do you think I am, your personal slave? Maybe you looked at your husband, we won't go there, uh, but who do you think I am, am I, wait, wait, what's being conveyed in that? Now listen to me, what's being, here, here's what's being conveyed, hey, I'm a part of the family. I don't want to be treated like a slave or a servant. Now, you know what, Christian? You ought to have the same attitude spiritually. Yes, I'm to act like a slave and a servant, but God says, no, 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 I don't want you to stay there, and I don't want you to act like that. I want you to be part of the family. I want you to enjoy intimate, close fellowship and intimate. You know what I, I'm thankful? Boy, when a mother or a wife feels like a part of the family, needs are being met, and there's a closeness there, you don't mind serving, but you also know you're not just a servant, you're part of the family. An important part of the family. God doesn't want you and I to stay here as a servant and a slave saying, oh, that's what you are. You need, to, you need to be reminded constantly you're just a slave and a servant. No, God doesn't say that. God says, I want you to be a brother and sister. I want to enjoy that closeness. Should we still act like a servant and a slave? Yeah, but I'll tell you, when I'm the brother of Jesus Christ, I don't mind serving him. I don't mind being a slave for God because I know that I am a part of the family and I get to enjoy a closeness and intimacy, a fellowship that no one else gets to enjoy. My friend, that's what God desires. Why do we settle for less spiritually? Why this past week were some of us just servants? We hardly talked to the master. We didn't strive to know his heart. We, we didn't strive to, to glean what he had. We, we just spent very little time, an acquaintance, and okay, let's just go through the duty. Let's just do it. And we, we kind of treated it. We settled for being a slave and a servant. May I tell you, friend, no Christian ought to settle for being a slave in relationship. You ought not. That's not what God wants. God wants you to be a brother, a sister, close, intimate fellowship. That's the meaning, the teaching of the passage before us. So may I encourage you, abide in him. Pursue this communion, the fellowship, this intimacy. Keep abiding in him. Now you say, Pastor Henry, how do I do that? Well, let's go back to the meaning or uh, the definition we looked at the word abide. Notice what it says. Maintain an unbroken yet growing communion with Jesus Christ. So in closing, in preparation for observing the Lord's Supper, I'm going to challenge you in three ways, uh, reflecting upon our study and saying, okay, I want to ensure that I am enjoying this close intimacy with Christ. Even as I enter into the Lord's Supper, boy, I I want to be that brother, that sister. Number one, I want to challenge you to commit to maintaining communion with Christ. Now, it seems basic. But commit to maintaining, as we get from the definition here, communion with Christ. The whole push and urgency of this passage in the many calls to abide. As we read it, did you catch how many times? Abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. Ye are the branches, I am the vine, abide in me. And the persuasion that he gave us for doing so, it screams of a passionate pursuit in maintaining communion. It's clear to me. That moving from servant to friend in this passage and the the later desired movement onward to brethren necessitates a passionate pursuit, a love-induced attitude that won't settle for anything but achieving that. See, do you passionately pursue intimacy with Jesus Christ? That's the question. Am I committed to maintaining this communion so much so that I am passionate about that? And one of the big parts of this One of the big parts of this is the idea uh, of protecting our communion with Christ. Protecting our time of fellowship, our intimacy, our closeness with Christ. You and I both know that Satan wants nothing more than to tear down our intimacy with Christ. Our closeness, our familiarity. 
The world at large wants to tear it apart, reduce our intimacy and closeness with God. And so may I challenge you tonight, you need to protect your communion with God, your fellowship with God, your intimacy. The relational position of enjoying his presence on a daily basis, continually, time and time again. Do it passionately. Passionately pursue maintaining a communion with God. When we were out in Yellowstone, one of the joys of our trip out there was to see all kinds of wildlife. We even prayed on the way out there, the Lord allowed us to see uh, wildlife, and boy, we did. Three nights in a row that we were in Yellowstone each evening when we were coming back out uh, to the eastern gate of uh, Yellowstone National Park, we were privileged to see a grizzly bear and her cub. A grizzly bear and her cub. And the first night that we saw it, as, as uh, things were getting dark each night, and, and the first night uh, we saw uh, this bear, it was about 200 yards away, kind of hard to tell, but kind of spotted. She actually had her snout sitting on a log, and the, the bear cub was back behind. And so at that point we kind of stopped, and others kind of stopped to look too. There was actually one or two already before us, and we stopped. And along came a, uh, some uh, what I call professional photographers that live in the area, and they just follow these bears and everything else and we came to know that the mama bear's name was raspberry why do you pick such nice names for a grizzly bear but anyway <laughs> um, raspberry and the cub she just had and they didn't know if it was male or female they named the cub jam raspberry Okay, anyway, uh, so that's what they named the cub, right? And so we're looking, and, and it was neat because that professional or that, that photographer, I guess, um, he had been watching the bear different days. Earlier that afternoon, they'd seen him. And so uh, here is the cub and the, the mama bear, raspberry and jam. And you say, Pastor Henry, you're a fantastic photographer. No, that's not my picture. Uh, <laughs> that, the other guy with the telescopic lens that was the length of my arm, he took the picture, and then I took it of his screen. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? And uh, you might see a little glare there indicating that all right and so those are it is neat to see the bears and everything else especially the bear with the cub it was interesting he was telling us that the mother brings the cub down by that road and where the traffic is to protect from the pack of wolves so where the people are, the wolves typically stay away and things like that. And so uh, she'd come down all the time and bring her there. So it was neat. Every night we did what was kind of <laughs> even more amazing. Every night we got closer. The first night was about 200 yards. Second night was between 100 and 50. And so the third night we're coming out, we saw some people by the side of the road, of several rangers, about five different park rangers. And, boy, we pulled over and we looked just across the road. And, and there, this is my photograph on my phone, there was Raspberry. There's a jam. And I mean, literally, they're about 50 yards to 75 yards away. And I, that was pretty neat, exciting. I got out, Erica did. She stayed for a few minutes. Kids stayed in the car at that point. And it was getting real dark, and you can see in the picture. And so I'm standing there, and the park rangers are there, and there's some other people. One of the park rangers was talking uh, to uh, a, a visitor to the park, but also some other rangers. And he was talking about, and I thought of all com uh, conversation topics, that's what you bring up. They were talking about another bear in Yellowstone that just killed somebody. That was very encouraging, <laughs> uplifting. And uh, he's, talking, he's literally talking about it, and they were talking, it was somebody who actually worked at the park and had gotten killed by a bear, and uh, they had discovered it later, and it was a mother bear, and uh, she was protecting her young. As we all well know, very passionate about that. And as he's sitting there talking about that, I'm looking. I'm 50 yards away from a mom and her cub. This is great. I, I don't believe in the evolutionary teaching of the survival of the fittest, but I do believe in the Pastor Henry belief of the survival of the fastest. <laughs> I do. And so at that moment, I sized up everybody around me, and I figured out my fastest route to my car, just in case. And so if that's me, so be it. Uh, <laughs> I found some people I could outrun, okay? And, uh, but why? Because you know what? Hey, you don't want to get between a mama bear and her baby bear. Because they are passionately pursuing protection. Now let me ask you this. How well do you protect your communion with Christ? Your time of fellowship. Are you that adamant where everybody knows, oh, ho, ho, they're spending time with God. Don't bother them. Every day, boy, they have their time. They're going to read the Bible. They're going to pray. And, and they're going to spend some time with God. This is, this is dad's time. This is mom's time with God. We don't want to mess with it. Oh, you don't have to take it to an extreme, but I ought to, may I tell you, you and I ought to protect our intimacy with God, our fellowship, our time of communion with Jesus Christ. We ought to mirror what even that demonstrates. Can I tell you, how is your passion, or may I ask you, how is your passion for maintaining that communion tonight? 
Number two, I want to challenge you real quickly. We ought to commit to increasing communion with Christ. I hope you've been challenged tonight. Uh, This idea, we see it in the definition of abiding. It's growing. It's increasing. It ought not to be the same this year as it was last year. uh, Where are you stuck at tonight? Where do you find yourself most often spiritually? Is it as a slave? Is it just as a servant or uh, just a friend? Or do you maintain a relational intimacy as a brother and sister? My friend, tonight, you and Christ alone know what your relationship was like. But here's a good way to know. If Jesus Christ were to speak from heaven tonight and address you, and address you based upon the level or degree of intimacy he enjoys with you, the communion you pursued and enjoyed this past week, would he call you servant, friend, or brother or sister? What would he call you? What would he say to you? How would he address you? Oh, it's a joy to be a brother of sister of Jesus Christ, but do we enjoy that? Do we pursue that? Number three, I want you to challenge you to commit to constant communion with Christ. That's in this definition, the idea of being unbroken communion. Nothing stalls a relationship like sin or offenses or something coming in between people. Nothing stalls it. Nothing affects it. It can be doing for us as Christians. It can be doing something you shouldn't do or simply not doing what you should do. The Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. And since there ain't any of us here that is perfect, it means that the impetus and emphasis for us must be on repentance, forsaking, forgiveness, and doing it quickly. So if we're going to be challenged, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to one day enjoy being a brother and sister of Christ and because of sin in my life, boy, I fall all the way back to serving. I don't spend too much time with the master because uh, that sin. My friend, we ought to work hard. We're not perfect. So boy, 1 John 1, 9, the Christian's bar of soap must be used daily. Amen? Children, that's a good advice. Wash daily, okay? Spiritually and physically. Use 1 John 1, 9. Wash up. Get clean, maintain a friendship. You know, the fact is this, sin in and of itself is heinous, it's ugly, it's despicable. But to consider the idea that it severs us from God makes it all the worse. That it destroys intimacy and fellowship and communion. Man, that makes sin the the ugliest thing around. So maintain a constant communion. The idea, obviously, is to abide with and in Christ, we strive for unbroken communion through quickly confessed and forsaken sin in our lives, forsaking it. Will you join me tonight as we enter into the Lord's Supper and understanding this truth? Christ died on the cross for us to have close, intimate communion with him every day, to be a brother to enjoy even the, the parts and the, uh, the fruit of friendship and also being a servant, but as a brother, a sister in Christ. He died so that we can enjoy a close and intimate relationship with him. Would you ask these questions? Have I assumed that role in my communion and fellowship with him? My daily intimacy, my time with him, have I assumed the role of brother and sister? Have I, have I grown into that? You know, if not, if we've neglected that tonight, wouldn't a night in which we celebrate the Lord's Supper be a great night to get it fixed? Say, Lord, I I want better communion. I want more fellowship with you. I want to grow in an intimacy like I have never had before. That's why he died. That's his desire in his heart.